Yeah, let's quickly review what uh, we were doing in the last class. Let's put them, the whole thing in proper perspective. And then we'll go to the next topic on subjective and objective evaluation. Uh, essentially, what we did was initially to uh, look at understeer gradient from the point of view of the tires. Okay? This, that's the first thing. In fact, the whole language of understeer gradient was talked in terms of alpha f, alpha r, and so on and so forth. So, it is the first thing that we started here. When we expanded the concept of understeer gradient, uh, remember that we were concentrating on the steering input and the corresponding behavior of the tire. In other words, whether I have to give more steering input or less steering input, this is what it came to. We realized that uh, there are a number of other factors which are going to play a role <coughs> when it comes to the steering input. In other words, other factors may make us give more steering input or give less steering input. In other words, there are other factors which are going to cause what we called as understeer or oversteer. The first thing remember we talked about uh, the uh, load distribution, redistribution during roll. We found that uh, the um, nonlinearity with respect to FZ uh, of the tire is going to cause a change in the alpha in other words the slip angle front and rear and so that roll would essentially cause a change in the understeer oversteer characteristics of the car. This is the first thing we saw, we saw that with the derivation. The next we saw is, uh, is with respect to the camber thrust, remember that we defined camber thrust uh, as the lateral force produced because of the presence of camber uh, of the tyre or in other words the wheel. Okay. So, we, we saw that the slope of that, um, that curve uh, which we curb the uh, camber force versus camber angle which we called as camber thrust, uh, uh, the uh, in the slope of that curve that becomes important and that is what we call if you, if you remember C gamma f, camber thrust is basically a force, I should not say that this is the thing, but anyway that is the slope of this curve between the force and the camber. Right? This we saw that that also has an effect. The result that I am very interested to find out what is the camber change uh, due to the, um, the, uh, the mechanism, the suspension mechanism and that is what you are going to do, do as a big exercise in the next course on vehicle dynamics laboratory when we use packages like Adams. Uh, then we come to uh, what we called as, as a roll steer. We said that uh, there is a change as the again as there is a roll, then there is a change uh, in the uh, angle of these uh, tyres and that would again cause uh, a behaviour where I may have to give more steering input in order to uh, compensate for that change of this tyre angle okay, and that is what we called as roll steer. Remember uh, we also defined when it is positive and negative and so on. Right. So, Essentially what we are looking at is how does the tyre take the force, change the delta and correspondingly whether it becomes understeer or oversteer. Then we looked at uh, what is called as the lateral compliance steer and again because the forces do not act exactly the centre and does not and may cause a yaw because they may be off centre and depending upon whether the yaw centre is the front or the rear, you know the vehicle will turn to the right and the left and so on, all those things we did. Lateral compliance steer is a very important concept uh, from that point of view and it has a, uh, uh, this we distinguish between a front lateral compliance steer and the uh, rear lateral compliance steer and the difference between them would cause uh, the vehicle to understeer or oversteer, okay. So, that is one of the things that we we introduced. Okay. Obviously, obviously we, we made a comment at the end of the class, we will come back to the comment. Obviously, aligning torque will have an effect. After all, aligning torque is what makes the uh, vehicle go straight, no, it is going to align the torque, right? Uh, sorry, align the wheel, right? So, aligning torque, anything which has an effect on the wheel also will have an effect. So, aligning torque has an effect, of course, on 
on the uh, understeer gradient. And so, the aligning torque value is given by, by this where P is a pneumatic trail, L is the wheel base and so on. So, in other words you have to give more delta that is why it goes in as an understeer if because of the uh, aligning torque um, as it becomes straight. So, I have to give more delta in order to compensate for it and so that is the value for the aligning torque. Okay. Note that uh, both P as well as C alpha f okay, both of them participate in this uh, particular derivation. And before we, we close this, this one more thing is the steering. You know, there is a lot of uh, things that we talk about steering. Unfortunately, again, uh, this course is so cramped, we would not be able to look at steering design and so on. Let us see that we will do that the component automotive structure and component analysis. And right now, I just want to state that steering also participates, obviously, steering participates in understeer uh, characteristics of the tire. Okay. So, steer, in, in other words, that being the input, steering has its own role to play. So, the K steering or the understeer gradient due to steering has an important comp component, okay, which is the, uh, which we call as, uh, of course, WF is known, which we call as KSS. Okay. So, this uh, KSS, in fact, it is called as, let me check, yeah this is called as KSS, where we look at the, the stiffness uh, or the compliance of the uh, steering okay, as well as we look at the radius, wheel radius, we look at the caster angle and the pneumatic trail. So, all these things also participate in what is called as the um, uh, role of steering on the uh, understeer gradient. Okay. So, we will we are, we are going to talk a lot more about steering in, in a few minutes okay, and its role on the whole of handling itself. And lastly, uh, the two things which we have left out. One is there is a load transfer to the front because of acceleration, deceleration and so on. We mentioned that. Uh, we have not taken that into account like what we had done for uh, uh, for the uh, you know rear uh, sorry uh, rear and front due to roll okay here this is due to pitch unfortunately the uh, model which we have won't be able to take that into account so you have to go to a much more detailed model if you have to look at how load transfer is going to uh, have an effect right uh, on this but when you do testing this becomes an important quantity uh, the the way the transfer takes place Okay, when you um, when you break or decelerate, okay, the transfer takes place, and due to which, what would be the difference in the force that is developed in the front and rear is going to have an effect. Okay, we're not considering this as a formula here, but we will consider that when we look at the subjective and objective rating. And lastly, the tractive force. You know, the other one is the tractive force. Tractive force is an effect. I leave this derivation. Uh, for you to look at in Gillespie, whole of these things as I told in the last class, the reference is Gillespie. So, here you would see a very interesting thing. The FXF and front and the rear FXR are the forces that act in the front and the rear. So, if this is the rear tire and if this is the say for example, this is the front tire, then those are the FXF and FXR okay, that act. Say for example, it can if there is a if it is a traction and if it is a front wheel drive, then FXF is what you will get and you will um, you if it is just a front wheel drive you would not get FXR whenever you are accelerating. Right? Now, look at this what happens. So, even for you know a neutral steer where the rest of it are not there. In other words, the first geometric term is affected by the traction. Okay, the very first term is affected by the traction. Okay. So, what happens higher the term, higher this is, lower is delta and hence there is a tendency to oh, 
oversteer or understeer? Yes, because you have to give me give more delta to it. Okay, so you will you will understand here in every term here. For example, if you look at this term, okay, there will be a more delta is minus, so it will become an oversteer quantity. So that will so delta is less, which means that it is oversteer. Okay, so delta is less here because there is a minus term here. The car tends to oversteer. Okay, so in other words, the front wheel drive has a tendency, okay, because of traction, to be oversteered. Okay, but due to other factors like A and B, uh, the distance between the uh, between the front axle and the center of gravity location, okay, that being small has a tendency to understeer. Okay. So, that is one of the contributions or this is this term is a contribution for the uh, understeer gradient. Clear? Okay. So, in other words what we essentially we have done is we have extended the understeer gradient to include 8 different parameters. So, if you look at the understeer gradient of the car, you have to consider all these things. Okay. Now, we will move further than this, you can, you can look at the, I do not want to interpret this, you can do that interpretation in each one of these cases, it is quite simple. So, we will go, go over to how to apply all these things, whatever we have studied in order to look at handling. Is it clear? Any questions? Uh, yes. Pneumatic trail, we already saw that. No? The force, lateral force does not act at the center, acts at the rear, you know that is the, the moment that is created, that distance at which this acts and gives the aligning torque. The force multiplied by pneumatic trail gives the aligning torque. Okay. So, that is what we saw long ago as the pneumatic trail. It is a we yeah we will we will talk about steering right now okay there are a lot of things which are going in the steering we will talk a lot more about steering okay right now what lateral compression what is it uh, can you repeat we saw that already that uh, the uh, force that acts okay will have a tendency for the vehicle to yaw the force that acts at the rear or the front will have a tendency for the vehicle to yaw. Depending upon whether the yaw that is produced due to the lateral compliance which is uh, in the sense that the force that acts, okay, depending upon whether it helps you, aids you in turning or prevents you from turning easily. Okay. So, when I am taking a turn to the right, if my lateral compliance, very simple terms, when I am taking a turn to the right, if my lateral compliance aids me in, in that further turning. Okay, I have a oversteer characteristics. If my that lateral compliance is going to be making me go in the other direction, then I would have a tendency to understeer. understeer. Right. So, depending upon so why, why is there a difference between front and rear? Because the yaw of center is, is different, the front and rears, you know, the way it is going to yaw respect to the front and rear are different. So, that is why uh, if I use the same notation, positive notation, you would find that there is a positive to front okay, and a negative to the rear. What is positive to the front? The same force is applied at the rear because the yaw center is now shifted, you will have a tendency to go to the right. Okay. So, there is a difference that is why we have Okay. So, here also the compliance of the steering system comes into picture, okay. that is that's very important and we are going to see that as well. Right. In fact, I have to spend a lot more time, I do not have that time now. So, I refer to Gillespie as a chapter on, on steering, but we will move now, we will move away and we will look at uh, subjective and objective evaluation. Okay. Let me finish this and then I will take the questions. Okay. Now, uh, there are a number of references, this is a topic, um, 
which I would say uh, has been very well researched, a lot of work has been done. So, let us um, look at a few of the work that uh, from where we are going to pick some concepts to understand what is subjective and objective evaluation. Before we go further, these are the references, reference SAE 980226, a group from you know, by Krola and others, Professor Krola and others. Uh, so that is uh, then, I mean that is uh, uh, the topic is vehicle handling and assessment using a combined subjective objective approach. An important very interesting paper, lot of data available. Uh, it has gone into a PhD thesis as well, correlation of subjective and objective handling of vehicle behavior by Ash from Leeds University. This Leeds University group has done lot of work on this with the help of Myra, uh, Motor Industries Research Association in UK. Um, a very interesting article recently published okay, in a book titled Road and Off-Road Vehicle System Dynamics Handbook and that one of the chapters there is Subjective and Objective Evaluation of Car Handling right, by Jim, G. Jim that has a lot of information on subjective objective uh, evaluation. Okay. So, basically we have uh, we are going to follow these people on subjective objective evaluation not to say that there are uh, uh, not others you know there are a number of reference other references, but we are just going to scratch the surface as far as the subjective objective evaluation is concerned huge topic. Okay. Um, let me go back if there are no uh, further things and you have a question. Yes, no, we are, we are, that is a, that is a grip, we are not talking about that. We are only talking about that is what is called, we will come to that uh, what is called limit handling. Okay. So, we are not talking about that, we are not talking about total grip. This gives us an idea okay, that in other words, we are in, when we talk about this, uh, we assume that we have not reached the limited, limiting grip. Okay. So, we are going to talk about limiting grip and at limiting grip what is the problem, okay. we are going to do that. So, if we are not gone into limiting grip yet, then why is the uh, still, uh, still see there are two things, one is stability, okay. safety is not just stability, the other is the driver's ability to follow a maneuver, okay. it is very or follow or follow a path rather, maneuver to follow a path. He does not want surprises, okay, this is very important. How much steering I have to give that, that field should be clean and clear. Okay. So, it is not that we all the time talk only about stability, handling as we are going to see now that is that is why this is the, the next topic. Handling is about lot more things than just stability. Okay. So, we are going to see the feel you know in other words what is that you want? You want easy driving, someone is going to drive for you fine that is the best thing to, that can happen to you, but if you are going to drive then comfort is very important, okay. safety is very important, okay. then limit grip, stability all those things. Okay. So, so, all these things no we, we are uh, you are right, I understand your question. Okay. We are going to talk about that in a minute. In other words, what you are asking is whether this will steal some of the force for FY. Of course, it is going to steal. Okay. Of course, it is going to steal. This formula does not bring that out. Of course, it is going to steal. In other words, that is what we call that as a friction ellipse. Friction ellipse is going to have an effect. We are going to see that. Right? That, does that answer your question? Yes, so, we are not yet there in that friction ellip, ellipse where we are not using this formula. In other words, you, you, we are not using this formula in order to analyze friction ellipse. No, I am only talking about how much delta I have to give and so on. Right? Okay. What is the effect of this friction ellipse? We have to wait. Okay. Yeah. And all these uh, uh, roll steel, etc., are they uh, derived only for the uh, uh, steady state learning case or? Yes, that is a that is a good question, you know we had uh, started on this, okay. understeer and oversteer all these things are derived for steady state. 
So that is why we introduced what is called as the transient understeer and transient oversteer. This becomes a very important test for subjective uh, evaluation. In fact, it, this, uh, this becomes so important that there are power of power on test okay, that becomes a bread and butter of some of these tire companies. Okay. Most instances, in fact, tire companies are at the forefront in order to understand the subjective objective evaluation basically because they are the people who are going to provide many of the field which we are talking about. Okay. So, there are three things now, I had done that before, but let me repeat this. So, I have a subjective evaluation, what is meant by subjective evaluation? We have expert drivers, not one, maybe a number of drivers, there is a jury may be available. So, this subjective means that it is the perception of these drivers. Okay. So, they have a questionnaire, in fact questionnaire design, okay, there are standards now, the questionnaire design is important. So, you can go and ask him obviously, you are all students, you know, so you do not, hey how was the car, you know, did, did it go well, no man, it is a damn squib, you know, this kind of thing would not work, right. I mean, so you have to have a proper questionnaire and a proper test procedure. So, you have to say that I am doing a steady state cornering on a smooth road, okay. are you able to hold the line, okay. Th this kind of things. In fact, Krola and others have got into about 39 questions okay. and then there is a rating maybe 1 to you know 1 to 10 scale and so on. Some people may differ, some people may agree, you know like all questions everyone would not agree. Okay, so, uh, we will we'll typically see these questions a bit later, but I am only telling you that there are a number of questions. Okay. So, there are tests and there are questions and there are ratings, okay, there are ratings, ratings may be 1 to 5 scale or 1 to 10 scale and so on. Now, this is subjective. The subjective evaluation has to be interfaced or correlated with objective evaluation. Okay. So, there is a test procedure of course, and there is an objective, what do we mean by objective evaluation? Remember that we saw one of the models, Memoro model, okay, which many, there are many tests which show, shows that the Memoro model is good model and it brings out the effectively the handling of the car, the area of that rhombus, Memoro rhombus is good enough to tell us whether the um, car is good or not. You know, this is, but there have been a lot of tests or a lot uh, in the literature, especially in this group from Leeds itself who say, says that this is not adequate, this is not adequate. Okay. The, uh, there is a the Japanese group which says that this is adequate, some group which says that it is not adequate. In other words, these four parameters which this uh, Memoro model considers may not be adequate representation is one of the things. Yes, to start with this is good, but if you want to go into niceties, this may not be adequate. In other words, this, this parameters start expanding now. Okay. So, you are at gain at, at some say 0 0.4 hertz, or 0 0.7 hertz and so on, you know they become important. So, Objective evaluation is many times in the frequency domain, most of the times in frequency domain, one or two in the time domain. Now, that becomes, they are values which can be derived from the measured, from the car, okay, a quantitative value which can be measured, that is the objective rating. So, the whole idea in subjective objective evaluation is to look at that correlation. For example, this correlation uh, in these papers is given by a formula. Okay, that can be a co this becomes very important. It's not very easy. You know, it's very easy to say this, but if you, this is not um, this is not very easy to actually correlate the subjective value. Why is this guy saying that in co during cornering, my the car is not holding out? You know why? He has to. You have to know it. So you have to have an objective evaluation. 
or objective or a reason from a, from what you can measure the characteristics of the car okay from a model then the third step which is important is this objective evaluation is then correlated with the design with design now what should i change if your damping is not good what is having an effect on your damp damping okay so what is having an effect so that this whole thing is clear so in other words if a driver uh, an expert driver comes and says that this car is has a problem what is called balance fara or something like that then what is why is that happening and how can i correct it so that is the complete route okay now let us look at subjective rating so as i told you last time that um, if you want to buy a car let's see what all you will do okay you know this already many of them but it's fun to look at how to evaluate a car we will we will come to a very specific uh, maneuvers later let's look at a very broad you know perspective of subjective rating so we we follow jim in what we are going to see now we already saw that in the uh, please link what we have done so far to what i'm going to present now yes sir uh, uh, assuming that we have a model for our car hmm. i mean if we uh, find out certain parameters of that model uh, assuming that model is exactly what the car will behave like then we'll have all the quantities to characterize the car yes so, i mean it should be very I mean, if we have those four parameters, then if they quantify the model exactly, then it should be adequate. Right, but it is not. You, you, your question is well taken. This is not like. Look at this carefully. This is not like design. For example, you did a course on uh, uh, finite element analysis or mechanics of materials. So there, for example, in finite element analysis, you were told that calculate the for me say stress, okay, or equivalent stress, and then compare this with your yield, okay. and then you are told that if it is less than the yield say maybe yield divided by uh, a factor of safety or permissible stress then it's fine so in the words there you calculated it and you had a fantastic um, you know criteria function which told you that look compare these two if they're less fine here i do not have a criteria function because i have too many parameters it's not one stress one form is a stress and then done with it it's not like that i have so many parameters and i don't know whether it should be less than this value or greater than that value or between this value i don't know that is the difficulty of design okay that's why we are looking at all these things so running straight what is it that you will look at we have we have seen all these things so running straight the first thing you will see is pull remember we did that long ago and we had put the blame on the tire and we said that okay the car will drift there is a forces are different conicity ply steer right so the first thing you would do when you take a car is to find out whether okay imagine that you are going to buy a car okay if you don't have the money ask your dad so you or your mom okay whoever has more money they can pay okay now you have this you go you see how much it is drifting okay this is straight away drift right this is what we call as residual pull then running straight this is one of the reasons for for it not to uh, not to go down or not to go to one side then there can be other things this when you run straight okay the tire may not be the reason for it to drift there are there may be other reasons where if i now if there's a pull the it may so happen that the vehicle can go like that what is going straight may go like that and that's drift but but the vehicle can also go like this okay it can go straight in here what's the difference here it can turn like this this can this is the pull you know this can be drift of the vehicle okay as you go 
down it may be due to steering system and so on. Then it can wander, it can wander, what is wander? It can go like that and remember that when, when we go over a bump or a rough road or whatever it is, okay, there can be, it is possible that the steering is not steady and it can wander or it can wander uh, uh, and be sloppy, all these things may be due to external disturbance like uh, say a crosswind flowing and so on. So, in other words, we are expanding the first thing called drift to take into account uh, a motion away from the straight line due to a crosswind, okay, due to road roughness and so on. The lower it is, is better. So, the first thing you do is to take a car and drive straight, hey, it is not going straight, I have to keep my steering all that time okay, engaged so that I do not I don't get into trouble, that is not a that is not a good situation, right. Okay. So, that is the first thing we have to do. Um, the other one is what is called as torque steer. Oh, steering happens not by only you, steering happens by so many things. Okay. So, what is torque steer? So, most of the cars that you, you drive for example, are the are front wheel driven cars. Okay, so, that the torque for the wheels are given to the front wheel. Sometimes it may have, why sometimes, you know, due to so many reasons that the left and the right torque may not be the same and there can be a difference because of which there can be a steer. Okay, there can be an unbalance in the torque that is given to the front wheel and because of that there can be a steer. So, I will have to do tests to look at whether when I accelerate it is going the other direction, when I decelerate afterwards whether it is coming back and so on. Right? So, what happens during my acceleration deceleration? First I will go straight, I will not even accelerate, I look at how this vehicle goes, is it dancing here and there, that is the first test I will do. Then I will take the car and accelerate, okay? see whether, okay, loosely hold the steering, see whether it is going to one side because of torque steer, it is steering on its own because of this acceleration that I am giving and because of the torque that is uh, available at the wheel, right. When I decelerate, is it coming back, okay. In other words, is the car having a path like that, first part is acceleration, second part is deceleration. So, this is what is called torque steer, okay. That is the next thing I will check, right or you will check. The other one when you go straight is braking and the performance of the vehicle when you brake. What do, I, what do I mean by performance of the vehicle when I brake? When I go fast and brake, I would like it not to lose the attitude. In other words, when I go and brake, it should straight be straight the nose. See, one of the major things in uh, the, the driver's field subjective is they look at that nose angle and they look at the feel in the in that steering. See, these are very, very important. Okay, though we talk about wander and other things, to keep, actually the driver would not allow it to wander, you know, they will it will, they will keep on correcting the steering. Okay, this is I am talking about testing in, even when you drive, there can be a wander and what does the driver do? He keeps on uh, adjusting. So, he knows the uh, nose of the vehicle, what is its attitude and he keeps on correcting it. The problem is either the tire wear will be high or fatigue of the driver will be high. So, he does not want his uh, uh, his attitude of the car, okay, uh, the nose angle does not want it to go up and down. So, braking straight is the deviation of the of the vehicle attitude, whether it is going to turn or it is going to uh, remain straight high. We look at then steerability. Okay. There is uh, what we call as look at that on, on center feel. Okay. What is on center feel? Right. We, um, we talked about steering. 
we talked a lot about steering and on center is a very practical approach to the steering performance. As, as it's written there, it's a, it is a feel, a perception about the steering torque and vehicle path. Okay? What do we mean by this? What is the what is responsible for this? You know, let us understand that. So now if I plot say for example steering angle, okay. versus the torque, steering torque, okay. this friction, a, a, a line of warning, whatever we are talking about is evaluating a car, not that you, would, you are going to, assuming that you are not going to drive at 30 kilometers per hour in this crowded roads. Okay. So, do not tell me that why are you doing all these things, anyway, I am not going to uh, drive beyond 30 kilometers. Subjective evaluation is not there. It is to understand the limit of the car. Okay? Right? So, there are a lot of subtleties. Right. Now, if you look at the, the torque versus steering angle, the first thing that comes to our mind is that steering having so many moving parts, there is friction. Okay? So, before the steering angle changes, I have to overcome those friction. Okay? So, it does not start here, I cannot plot 0 versus thing, so it will start here. Okay. After this, there is a compliance of the, we go into the compliance of the steering system. Okay. So, the steering angle versus steering torque takes that kind of turn and so we have, so this region we have what is called as the steering effort, the steering effort. Okay. So, I have to overcome friction after which I will then look at how much uh, is the uh, effort that I have to give in order to drive. I can plot another graph which is very important which is the angle versus, versus the vehicle path. Angle versus the vehicle path. Okay. How is it going to look like? It is going to look like this. Yeah, any questions? Which angle is this? This is the steering angle. This is the steering angle. Okay. Fine. Okay. So you would see. I mean, let's say that it's it's symmetrical about the center. You would see that. Look at this. There is an angle of the steering after which a path change is going to take place. This is very important. Okay. This is called as the dead length. This is called as the dead dead length. Look at the subtlety, this is very important. So, this I, the friction is very important, a okay, lot of friction and lot of compliance, my driving effort, my steering effort is going to get affected. After all, everything depends upon steering for the subjective ratings. In other words, the driver's feel all depends upon the steering. So, this is called as the dead length. Okay. So, what does it mean? It means that if I if I now play with my steering within that within that length the car's attitude will not change okay why is this important what should it be a difficult question to answer but you can look at the plus and the minuses of this assume that the dead length is is large what happens then i i turn the vehicle uh, attitude will not change Okay, after some time, after I turn a, a bit, okay, then it will start changing. Oh, that's not that's not good. In other words, um, the feel is not going to be good. 
okay so the larger it is i'm not happy with it now what happens if it is zero smaller bring it to zero right yes that's correct so if there are disturbances small disturbances uh, in the road and it's going to have an effect on my uh, on my steering small vibrations uh, due to that okay small disturbances on it is going to change my uh, vehicle attitude or vehicle path and hence i have to keep on adjusting it so this is this this is together the perception of the the torque to the vehicle path you know this is what is called as the on center field so when you're plotting the vehicle path what does it actually mean the path you want to take the, usually the path is measured by the nose angle to your path now how much is the nose angle different from the path you want to take the deviation. deviations okay. that's it what is the, the the deviation sense that you want to you can plot that as an angle of the no, no nose angle of the so as i told you most of these things when i say that there is a path and deviation from the path we talk about the nose angle okay even when you look at the understeer or oversteer uh, characteristics of the car um, we look at nose angle okay nose angle is simply the attitude of the car okay so if the car is going to go it has to go like that and if the car goes if this is the car and goes like this that is the you know attitude uh, or the nose angle simply the nose of the car how it is with respect to the path you want to follow is it oversteer no 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 we, are, we oversteer. please note that no 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 we are not talking about oversteer or understeer it will be small angle it is no that's a, that's exactly what i'm saying this is the characteristics of the steering okay Ca yes you can interpret it in that language that is why we have this guy here right so that's why we said that the k steering has an effect okay right that is why we have one effect so in other words in a broad sense steering has an effect on understeer and oversteer clear okay but this dead zone is not understeer characteristics it is the compliance which affects the understeer characteristics clear okay sir you said the the dead line was so that this converts shouldn't cause the vehicle but if that disturbance happened when your steering angle is not at the dead line no that's correct if it is off that's what is called as off center if it is off center okay and if there are disturbances you have to control no doubt about it okay but when you are going straight i do not want the disturbances to be affecting see that directly impacts your uh, fatigue right because you keep when you go straight you keep on turning you know fun is lost how much would this value be uh that's what i said it's very difficult to say what should be the value yeah. no, this would uh, uh, see actually if you look at the total steering input it runs to 300 uh, you know degrees there is it is not that it is 5 10 20 30 so this may be of the order of about 8 10 or maybe less much less than that okay plus or minus 4 5 that kind of thing it's so a very small uh, value because you would see uh, how much the the ang actually the, the steering changes okay because when you when you go straight so actual steering you would see you go and turn you know the turning is, is the angles are so high okay the ra the ratio for example between the wheel and this may be in the, in the order of 30s how is this deadline actually realized what how is it dead length realized that's what i said that's that's a steering it's a uh, it's a part of this steering characteristics okay that's a part of the steering character compliance is due to so many things in the steering and so on yeah in a dead turn what will be the torque required by the driver that is exactly what i'm saying so that is related by this one okay so there is a difference there's a subtle difference between this and this here we are looking at the change okay and torque is not produced to change the vehicle angle in other words here we are looking at the 
correspondence between the steering angle and the wheel. Okay, that's what we are looking at. Here we are looking at how much the steering angle changes uh, required in order to get the steering torque going. Okay, that is what we are talking here. In other words, here this is due to the friction. <coughs> okay, so that would be the type of graph. So I that's why I distinguished between the two. They drew drew it in such a fashion that this is the angle, and that is the uh, you know attitude that you look at. <coughs> then you have what is called as the steering response and linearity. Okay, how linear is the uh, steering with respect to the path that it is going to follow? Is it linear or non-linear? In the sense that if I progressively increase the steering, is it that my what I want? Is there's a corresponding radius which is followed? Okay correspondingly for the same velocity. We are not bringing into effect the concept of understeer as we had learnt now. Okay. It is a question of as I change the angle, am I into surprises okay. or the change is progressively linear. So, that is what we call as the linearity of uh, this one. Oh, okay. I left that steering response. One of the other things that apart from this is that we can look at this response in a time domain okay in a time domain in other words if i now change the steering okay or the steering angle now what is the path change and after how long does this path change take place in other words if I now plot the time, you know, the, here I, I do not have a time, I am now plotting it with respect to time, okay. time versus angle, steering angle. Okay. I give, let us say that it is like that. It takes time for me also to give an input, right? So that is what this is. Now, I want to look at after how long does my car start uh, negotiating this maneuver? Okay. So, it may happen that the car which is going straight will keep going straight for some more time which is that response time after which it will start going. Right? So, if it goes this this I amount mean, how much it goes is what we call a steering gain but this time after which that vehicle realizes that there is a steering input and starts changing the course okay that is what we call as steering response the plot below is actually the vehicle time time this is time that is the part No, no, okay, fine. Uh, does not matter because I am uh, just going straight, that is all. You know, this is only a subjective uh, representation, not a very objective representation. Okay. I am going straight, I am changing it, that is all. After how long I change, that is all the line, right? Okay. So, that is the steering response. Then we have three things, you know, steering precision, steering angle, steering effort. Okay, or this thing followed by what is called as returnability. So, how do you test all these things? Okay, we, we, we will uh, look at the three things, it is the name indicates what they are. How do you test all these things? So, let us say, let us say, let us give you a test, let us not become too technical. Let us say the returnability. What is returnability? Steering has to come back. Okay, and so suppose I tell you, you you design a, a test to look at returnability. Okay, how what will you do? Let it come back if you give the steering angle zero wind. 
does it go back to the same course? Yes, but how will you do a test? No, is, is it going to be subject to object to? Of course, we are looking at subject to test. Then we'll need uh, a lot of uh, users just driving it. No, 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 no. That's all fine. But what is that? See, there is a difference between evaluation, okay, and a test procedure, okay. So how will you do it? Sir, so, but what test procedure is subject? That's what I am asking you. What is the test procedure you think can be done in order that I can test, say, for example, returnability? See, that is how you you look, you you conceive a test. So each one of them will have a test. You know, so that's what I said: subjective evaluation. Then there is a test. Then there is a feel. Then there is a mark. Uh, there is a grade. Then look at the objective evaluation. So what is the test? Simple. I go straight. I flick the steering. Okay, this is called flick test. Flick the steering. Okay, then how fast the steering comes back? What is my feel that steering comes back? It can also be measured. Okay, so these are. So for everything, there are tests. Right, and we'll we'll talk more about this. We'll complete this. We'll talk about a few of the tests at least in the next class. Mm -hmm.